Welcome, everyone. We are excited to have you on our webinar today, Meet the Experts, Emerging Issues Around Vaping. I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping announcements today. Um, all participants have been muted, so please use the chat feature for questions. Um, you're welcome to ask questions throughout, um, but, it, but you're also welcome at the end when we actually have our question and answer period to um, jot your questions down then. A recording of this webinar will be posted under the e-learning tab on our website. You'll see the link on your screen. To request a certificate of attendance, please email mountainplains underscore pttc at utah.edu. Right now, I'm going to turn the time over to our moderator, Dr. Jason Burrow Sanchez. He is the professor and department chair of the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Utah. He's also the PI and co-director of the Mountain Plains Prevention Technology Transfer Center. Hi, Jason. Hi, hi Rory. Thank you. Thank you for turning this over. I appreciate everyone who's, who's out there um, listening in today, and we hope this is going to be an informative and an interactive discussion that we have. I'm really excited to have our panelists here, and I want to thank them just as we get started here for their time and efforts to be here. Um, they each have unique perspectives on what they're going to share around this topic of vaping. <clears throat> And kind of what it looks like from their perspective, what they're doing in their fields, and, and how we can interact, and, and you know what that looks like from, from all of us from a prevention perspective in terms of what we're doing in this area. So just briefly, I just want to go and introduce our panelists, um, Dr. Sean Callahan from the University of Utah, um, Braden Ainsworth from uh, the Utah Department of Health, and Susanna Burt from the Utah Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. So thank each one of you for being here. What I'm going to ask you to do now, just briefly, if you just briefly just kind of introduce yourself and tell us what your what your position is, and then and then we'll have just each everyone to do that, and then we'll get into some questions. So, Dr. Callahan, if you start starting, thank you all for for having me. Uh, my name is Sean Callahan. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician at the University of Utah. I also work at the Salt Lake VA. Um, I've been seeing a lot of patients with this um, e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury in the past year, um, and then performing research in that field as well. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Great. And I, again, I'm Braden Ainsworth. I work at the Utah Department of Health. I'm the program manager for the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program. So that program houses all of our uh, tobacco use, tobacco product, and includes vaping as well. Great. And I've been uh, working in that program for the last seven years in various roles and just working to try to combat this issue. Sure. So. Thank you. Thank you, Braden. Hi, thanks for having me. Yep. My name is Susanna Burt. I'm the Program Pre Prevention Program Administrator with the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. And one of the things we look at is the prevention component for substance use and mental illness. So we look at the risk and protective factors around the state and in the communities to help prevent those negative outcomes that are related to sure. mental illness or substance use disorder. Sure. Great. Thank you. And thanks for each taking some time to introduce yourselves. Um, as the audience can see, there definitely we have some experts here from different areas, and that's nice because we can get some unique perspectives about what you're doing in your particular field. So I wanted to start off by um, ask, asking Dr. Callahan, what are some of the things you're seeing in the work that you're doing, either in the research or the patients you're seeing? And it sounds like some of your work is, is really dealing with some of the outcomes, perhaps, of using e-cigarettes and, and other vaping products and so forth. Sure. So that's a fair question. <laughs> um, honestly, this uh, snuck up on the medical field quite a bit. Um, what has been in, um, open in the public in the last uh, year or so has been this illness that's been going around associated with, uh, with vaping, which is... Um, looks like a pneumonia, like a, a bad case of the flu and pneumonia, um, something uh, referenced before as E-Valley. Mm -hmm. um, what we've been studying at the University of Utah has been um, uh, patient outcomes following that illness since um, it is, is largely ceased at this point, um, but then also trying to understand the underlying biology that's, that's led to this illness. Um, and then we're also coordinating with um, state and national health departments to follow these patients' um, outcomes going down the road. Right. Um, and then I also see patients in clinic who are still vaping. They've not suffered this illness, um, but there are higher rates of other respiratory illnesses associated with it. So uh, patients can have worse cases of asthma associated with it, worse cases of COPD associated with vaping. So it can exacerbate some of the conditions that they have. Correct. Yeah. yeah. What, are there any age ranges that you're particularly seeing or, you know, what, what are your, what's a, some of the common characteristics, maybe some of the patients. Yeah, that's, that's a fair question. Um, 
predominantly younger people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much of that is uh, specific to um, young people getting these illnesses more versus it's just the demographic that sure. tends to date more. Sure. Um, but tends to be younger people, often adolescents, 20, 20 30 year olds. Okay. And any products that, I mean, you hear a lot of things about the, in the news in terms of vaping THC or THC that is perhaps not, not manufactured by one of the typical manufacturers of these products or um, vitamin E acetate and so forth. Are there any products that you're seeing in particular that are associated with some of these things? Right. So the, this illness that was um, in, the, in the news for about half a year um, seems to be predominantly related to THC products. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the main culprit that we think has been um, vitamin E acetate. Now, the data that points for that is, is correlative, not causative, sure. um, but it's highly suggestive that was the cause pointing toward probably a tainted product okay. um, in the supply. Um, as that's probably gone away, this, this illness e-valley has, has faded. Um, the, the problem, um, there's a separate problem though, that this is widespread. So you, we see people, especially young people, using vaping products sure. of any, any type. So um, THC, nicotine, et cetera. Um, and this is, I'm sure my colleagues will get into this more, but it's a largely unregulated field. Sure, um, sure. And we're seeing other forms of lung illness as a cause of this. Sure. Or so exacerbating. So it may not be exclusive to one particular product um, per se. Um, a pulmonary disease uh, may not be related just to the THC laser sure. vitamin E. Sure, yeah. sure. Gotcha. Okay. What? Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Yeah. Kellen, what are some of the other um, respiratory issues that you're seeing most commonly? You said COPD, and that usually, yeah. what age does that usually present? It's usually itself? older people, so it's going to be usually above the age of 40, and especially 50s and 60s. I'd say most people that I see with um, uh, hard-to-control respiratory disease uh, with concomitant vaping usage are going to be asthma in young people, okay. so poor, uh, poorly controlled asthma. Okay. And, and just to confirm this, uh, so... So you're seeing these type of things happening in, in patients who aren't vaping the, the uh, vitamin E acid, Correct. right? Correct. It's just general Correct. vape products. Yeah. Correct. Interesting. So, and um, one of the things I was interested in, have you seen a peak in that? Do you think we're on a, we're on a down, downward slide? Or where do you think that's at? Or do you think it has peaked yet? Or the, what are your thoughts in terms of the patient loads that you've seen and so forth? Um, you know, this, this, this illness that was prevalent in the past year, that's definitely peaked. That mm -hmm. seemed to peak in the, in the fall. Um, I, I don't know if I can gauge like respiratory illness that's related sure. to regular vaping use at sure. this point, but you know, I have clinic three days a week and usually once a week I'll see someone who's got asthma and they're vaping. Okay. And one of the first things I tell them to do is please stop. Stop vaping. Yeah, yeah, sure. And how does that go with patients in terms of what, what is their a typical response to not vaping? Um, you know, if you have a 20 year old, you tell them to do something, they often don't want to <laughs> yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, varying levels of sure. acceptance. Sure. Um, uh, most, most people get that this probably isn't safe for them to do, but some people think that it's uh, in denial. They're in okay. denial. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you very yeah, much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Braden, from your perspective, one of the things we talked about is, is kind of the, the manufacturer and perhaps the legislation around some of this stuff. And I know that's one of the areas that you kind of focus on. I think about that from your perspective from the Department of Health. Can you say more about that? And you know, what do we need to know? Yeah, in terms sure. Of, and it seems like this what we hear in the news, especially when most states are in a legislative session now, these things are changing all the time, right? And it's hard to keep up. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Um, I think the approach that the Department of Health has taken, and I think public health in general, is to try to mirror policy that uh, has been successful with tobacco control in the past, mm -hmm. right? So there's decades of of policy work and approaches that have happened uh, to help get rates to a historic low. I mean, here in Utah, our, our youth uh, cigarette smoking rate is, is around, you know, one and a half percent. So it's, it's really low. And so over time, you know, what was useful in, in getting those down, you know, a, a media campaign, uh, taxes, maybe other restrictions on retailers, indoor clean air laws. And so I think what we've been doing is trying to implement those same things for e-cigarettes because nicotine is the underlying factor with them. Sure. And so when you look at legislation that's happening, and I, I did a little bit of research about all the states that are on this call to try to see what legislation um, they're working on too. And a lot of it is very similar to what we're doing in Utah. So, mm -hmm. so you're looking at taxes. That's one of, the, one of the big things that has historically driven down 
uh, the use of tobacco products. And they're virtually unregulated and untaxed at this point. So adding a tax on there uh, is considered a best practice. You've got restrictions on flavored products, trying to keep them out of the hands of youth, maybe moving them into adult-only stores. Uh, you have uh, other components like uh, retail, retail amendments, which are trying to make it so there's, you can permit retailers or try to make it so it's harder for these retailers to sell things or, or get around the laws that currently exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some of the approaches that, that we have right now going through the legislature. Uh, and uh, those are considered best practices from CDC. There's a lot of things that come up uh, from the industry or from the, the vape side of things that, uh, that they try to get through, which, sure, aren't, sure. which aren't considered a best practice. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a little bit of give and take, but yeah, that's kind of the approach that goes on uh, with yeah. controlling these products. Well, because there's an industry behind this as well. So that's one of the things you're kind yes. of working against. I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption here. And, yeah. And, and they have huge budgets, right? Yes. And uh, they can, you know, move products and so on and so forth. They do this in different ways. So it sounds like in part, the legislation tries to keep up mm -hmm. with some of what's going on in, in, the, in the market. Yeah. And unfortunately, with the vaping issue, I think we all could see that the same tricks and the same tactics were being applied as with tobacco products, uh, maybe around like 2014, 2015, sure. and kind of mobilizing public health to start, you know, addressing those things is a little slower sure. than I think it should have been. And I think that because of that, it, <clears throat> it took off uh, quite a bit. And so there's a little bit of catch up, but you're right, you now have an industry which is which is quite large and many tobacco companies own part of vaping companies sure, as well. Sure. And so uh, when you're, when you're at the legislature, when you're trying to do policy, you're running into their priorities. Um, just a couple of them that I wanted to highlight is yes. one that, one that they love to do, which has been some, which has happened here and in some other States is called preemption where maybe there's a good bill that looks like it's a great idea, but there's a clause in there somewhere that will say something like, um, local communities can't do anything in addition to what's in this bill, gotcha. which, which is very problematic. And in some cases, it tries to undo what has happened in the past. Uh, so that's a, that's a trick that tries to get in there. And then another one is trying to take the burden off of retailers and place all of it onto the youth. So we know, I mean, the youth go in, they're, they're curious, maybe they want to rebel or whatever, or maybe some social situations have gotten them to this point that they want to try the product. But it's not fair to place all the blame on them when retailers are enabling them as sure. well. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting situation that way as well. Sure. Yeah. So one of the thoughts that I had, you know, as you were talking, you talked about the parallels between kind of regular cigarettes or combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And so Mike, one of my questions is, is there anything that makes e-cigarettes unique that, that you have to think about, you know, kind of a parallel process of running some of the campaigns we've done to reduce combustible cigarettes, is there anything about e-cigarettes that makes it unique that we have to do maybe a little bit differently or that you're learning yeah. now? Yeah, so a couple of things that come to my mind. Um, traditionally with tobacco products, uh, cigarettes, it's, it was typically the high risk uh, population that were using those. And e-cigarettes started that way. As Juul became more popular and became yeah. kind of a hip thing, it became more mainstream. Yeah. And so you've got a, a bit of a different audience. Um, another thing too that's been really tricky is, is messaging this with media. Uh, we've done some focus testing with some different concepts that worked really well with tobacco control, and they didn't test so well among youth. Okay. And one of the main reasons for that was because it's hard to point at the harms. Uh, it's clear that some harms are now coming to light, and you're being, yeah. you're being able to say, okay, look, there's some direct correlations. There's been deaths related to vaping. Um, but, you know, when we did some of that focus group testing, you couldn't say, this causes cancer. This Absolutely. will cause COPD. And without that, that message... We were kind of restricted to nicotine is bad. It's an addictive substance and it can lead to other things, but that was about it. And the messaging wasn't strong enough, it seemed at that time, to get the youth uh, to make any meaningful change. Well, yeah, because they were told that it was safer. I mean, it was marketed originally to be sure, safer right. than cigarettes. And so kids think, oh, it's not as bad, so of course I can use it. Yeah, so, that's, that, so you're combating that message yeah. too, which has been and reinforced over sure, and, and that kind of ties into the, I, think, I mean, think about it. we literally have decades of research on combustible cigarettes. We, we don't have that yet on, on e-cigarettes. We're getting more every day, but it's going to take a while. So some of, some of it we don't know, right, mm -hmm. in, in terms of that, and so the message you can give to youth or people you, you think that are at risk for using e-cigarettes may be very different. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the things you're 
kind of work it against. Yeah, that's or right. work it against you, perhaps. That's right. Your messaging. That's right. So we've been doing uh, <laughs> testing, focus group testing, trying to isolate what works best, and sure. for, especially for that messaging piece of it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, Susanna, I want to ask you, because I think this relates to some of what you can talk about, is kind of risk and protective factors with youth yeah. around why, why some youth maybe pick up e-cigarettes and why some youth don't and, and what those things look like from your perspective. Right. And it is that perception of harm is a big factor right now, that they think it's safer. Um, we found that same thing with some of the opioids. Back when the opioids started, opioid crisis started, you saw people thinking it was safer because it was a prescription versus heroin on the street. They feel the same way about the vaping. And when you start marketing it with the flavors of cotton candy and bubble gum, um, and it doesn't smell offensive, it doesn't smell bad. And they think, oh, I can do this. I eat cotton candy. I eat chew sure. bubble gum. It's not a big deal. Uh, so they, that perception is a big factor in it. And another one is actually, you mentioned the social situations. If your peer group, it's a really strong predictor of whether or not someone's going to use a substance, whether it's tobacco, e-cigarettes, or alcohol. Um, so you're seeing that play into the fact if you, you're in a peer group that has more people that like to vape or one person that's an influencer wants to vape, sure. you're more likely to begin or pick it up. The other thing that I found, um, and I agree, there's very, very little research on there uh, out there for anything. Um, and I would love to continue to support all the research that's going on so we can have a better sure. Um, a strategic plan to this. So one of the things I did find though was when you have per the parents that are, they're the ones actually, for at least in Utah, they're, they're the ones providing it to mm -hmm. youth. It's a parent or an older adult um, handing it to a youth, which makes it a, an issue that maybe we need to educate the parents. And it's okay if you, well, I shouldn't say it's okay. But as an adult, you get to make those decisions for yourself and that maybe you should consider the, um, the boundaries or the rules you're setting up with your kids, saying, you know what, when you're an adult, you can make this decision, but right now, I don't want you doing this. Sure. So I think those are things that we want to really stress with our communities and our schools and our, our, um, our agencies that it's not just like, it can't just be the retailer, it can't just be the research, it can't just be one thing, it's all about us coming together to work and see a decrease in these negative outcomes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one of the things you talked about is, is the parents and, and having others involved in the peer group and so mm -hmm. forth. So the studies that I've looked at, you know, because there's a lot of prevalent studies out there, like it, it's, it happens this often yeah. and so on and so forth between you know, middle school and high school and, and uh, older ages. And then some of the studies I've looked at <clears throat> have talked about, they've asked youth why they use it or, you know, how they get access to it. And one of the things that I know from some of the studies yeah. is it's because who they're around. Right. So it could be a parent, it could be an older sibling, it could be a peer, right. and so on and so forth. Um, do you think as well, because Brayden was kind of alluding to this, in terms of the, you know, is there kind of throughout these different kind of uh, frameworks or, or, or social units kind of a lack of thought around, it's not as harmful maybe? It's, yeah. it's something that's... It could be. And yeah. again... I would say possibly because we yeah, have lots yeah, of research. Yeah, just, yeah, what's your but thought? I would say, yeah, um, I think the best thing though is that parental attitude. So when we look at risk and protective factors, sure. one of the things is parental attitudes favorable towards substance use yeah. or other problem behavior. And I think uh, looking at what we know, they're a strong influencer. And so Brayden was mm -hmm. talking about how we look at what's already been established with tobacco or other substances. When we look at alcohol or tobacco, a, a parent's influence is so much stronger than they realize. And so for them to say, this isn't okay, would be sure. probably the best thing to start in a community or in a family. Sure. Having those, those, those conversations where you say, let's talk about what is appropriate in our family. Um, and uh, again, if mom or dad or grandma or sister or brother uses a vape, um, that's something to talk about. Is it appropriate for a sixth grader to sure. use? Sure. Is it, you know, it goes back to me, for me, brain chemistry. Like, as we start using this, any substances earlier and earlier, it creates those pathways for, for dependence and addiction. Mm -hmm. And so whether they're starting with a vape that has, well, that they don't know what's in it, whether it's nicotine um, juice or if it's uh, marijuana or something else, that's creating a pathway for dependency. Sure. Um, and I think that's where we could start. 
the other thing that I think parents or communities could really look at, because it works for any age group, is the social development strategy. Mm -hmm. And that works not with risk factors, but with protective factors. So I have a number of friends that may be in recovery for whatever substance or who also vape they can set those standards, but also giving their kids skill and opportunity to bond with them or with, with positive environments. So whether they're on a sports team or whether they're into theater or whether they're like um, going outdoors and hiking as a family, meaning sure. a mom or dad or a sibling. And that's really encouraging that positive um, behavior rather than, hey, let's go down to the store and grab the vape. Sure, <laughs> so, sure. So one of the things I think you're suggesting too is that it may, you can't rely on one specific unit no. to do that. You can't rely on just the school or just the family or just, it has to be no. really a, a, a combination. If you think about things. how much, even when I, I am very grateful for the research and for the policy, but if you were just to rely on one policy or just hoping that the research is going to educate people, I don't think you're going to have the outcomes change. Mm -hmm. um, as much, I mean, I think that you'll slow it. And I think when you're talking about taxes, uh, that's a really big deterrent for youth. And we yeah. know that's where they're starting their marketing. But um, when you come bring together researchers and the Department of Health and businesses, so really having that business sure. component in there, uh, you have uh, mental health or behavioral health, you have schools, everyone coming together to say, this is my role and this is what I can do. I don't try to do what Brandon does, nor am I ever qualified to do what Dr. Callahan does, but there are things that we can work together to really accomplish. And that's where we really stress coalition work um, at not just the state level, but at the community level. Um, I think that's really, really crucial. You think about, you think about the schools and how much, you know, like I know these policies in Utah, how many different things are supposed to be done at the school each year? Right. You can't ask it's, them to do it's a tall bill, right? yeah, like yeah. all yeah. these different things. That's why as a family or as a community member, whether you have kids or not, we have to work together. Sure, sure. So parenthetically, I was last night I was at a middle school giving a talk to parents about yeah. raping. And they had a lot of these questions about what do we do yeah. and how do we approach it. And a large part of it was some of the youth were at different levels of risk, so to speak. Some were at really low risk where they're probably not going to vape. Some are a little higher risk, and some might be in the category where they're, they're at your clinic. You may see that your clinic and so forth. So it, it kind of depends, maybe our approach is kind of dependent where some of these youth are at yes. and in terms of that level of risk. And I do think that's where the strategic planning, so I can't do my job without research. Well, I could, but I would strongly discourage doing my job without research. Sure. Um, but that's where I rely on you, and so having you or other researchers involved to help guide what we're doing. Um, Dr. S uh, Rose Sanchez already pointed out, we don't have a lot of research. We yeah. don't have a lot yeah. of policy. When, you, when you're doing a query online or in literature, it's the, the um, incidences. It's yeah, not, it's right. here's the best trade, practice. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, not there yet. and one of the things that I would go back to, and, and going back to what you mentioned, Braden, was going back to what we know works. And for us, the National Institute of Drug Abuse has their prevention um, principles. Mm -hmm. They've got 16 of them. And when you're developing or looking at doing a strategy in your community, I would say, does it follow these, these guidelines? Because we don't want to do harm. We don't want to have waste of resources or a waste of time. We're injuring kids and encouraging them to do things or scaring them, in, even among adults. So that's where I would really stress that we look at that too, Sophie. Thank you. Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I get a lot of questions about, and I'm wondering your response is this, is the technology has changed, right? So it, it's different than combustible cigarettes. It, it smells different, right? Or it may not have be odorless. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have be able to have, you know, rechargeable batteries. It may be disposable. The quantity that you can use, the flavoring involved. You can get your initials put on your favorite vape device. I mean, when you go on these websites, they're really slick in terms yeah. of how the marketing is. And I, I don't vape, but I, I would want to buy one of these things, right? I'm joking. But... What do you think about that? Because technology is attractive to you, right? We take phones as one example. You know, many times my experience has been youth tend to research their next iPhone purchase more so than they're going to research the next substance they're going to put in their body, so to speak. So how do you think the technology has maybe played into some of this? Um, what are your thoughts? It's, it's been interesting for a lot, of, a lot of different reasons. So one, the, the risk of, 
of harm probably goes up. Mm -hmm. So we assume that, I mean, so there's over 7,000 different flavors on the market. And um, these, these patients are, are heating those, um, those flavors to different temperatures, and we don't know what all those toxic byproducts will be. And it could um, be changed to different temperatures, right? Cor uh, correct, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I mean, there, mm -hmm. there even some people are, are using these um, not as intended and dripping, um, you know, THC oil directly on the heating substance. So they're getting incredibly sure. or heating source. So it's it's really hot and giving off a lot of temperatures. Um, so we don't know what the um, damage to people's lungs would be just from those toxic substances. The other the other fascinating part of the technology is. Um, um, with Juul, I mean, they, they increase the rate or the amount of nicotine in the product. Yeah. And with the dripping of THC, you're getting a really fast high of THC. So the technologies will allow this to be a lot more addictive than it was, right. you know, 10, 12 years mm -hmm. ago when it first came on the market. Um, so I'm totally sympathetic to um, your response. We don't know how to address this. This is all brand new. These are new products in the last five, six, seven years. Um, and we're, we're ill-equipped to um, approach it right now. Sure, sure. And even with you mentioned THC, but also with the nicotine salts, the changes in terms of the solutions, mm -hmm. it's yeah. easier, quote, it's easier to ingest higher levels and higher concentrations of nicotine than it was with just regular combustible cigarettes. Another um, thing that's really interesting is so like the Juul pod, the nicotine content in the Juul pod is about a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that that is unique about that when you're when you are smoking a pack of cigarettes, you kind of measure them out sure. with your own habit of whatever you do, right? You take a smoke break, you smoke two cigarettes, you smoke one, and then you take three breaks a day, and that's kind of how you do it. When you have a e-cigarette or you have a Juul, there's no like measure to parse out how many puffs you're taking or, yeah. or, or such. Um, and then, it, then you include the nicotine salts, which are less abrasive yeah. uh, you know, to the system, but more addictive, and you are puffing away on it all day and the convenience of having it um, with you all the time and using it kind of incognito and not having that smell. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think just that, you know, that addictive possibility is so much higher with these products mm -hmm. um, than with combustible cigarettes. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Because that makes it one of the harder things to combat in terms of technology has changed and the induction of how you use this has changed. Um, and it's, you know, we have to kind of keep up with, with that in terms of how we're addressing it. And the types of products yeah. are crazy. Yeah, like, yeah, sure. absolutely. like there's a, there's a, the time, there's a vape right? watch that looks like an Apple watch that yeah. you can take off. Yeah. There's, there's like sweatshirts that you can buy that have a little yeah. thing that comes up Once through the like sleeve. Yeah, like like just a, an actual pen. specifically to hide them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so the detection, I mean, the, the, there's less opportunity for people to detect it. So if you, you know, one of the things you work in schools, one of the things you hear about a lot is kids vaping in schools and teachers or administrators having a hard time even detecting that that's going on. And if you think about it, like that's the marketing plan. If they're yeah. not trying to market to me as an adult that can go out and do whatever I want, yeah. not all I want. That's but like they're, they're marketing to youth to be covert, to hide it. It's a, it's a secret. Um, that's, that's part of their marketing strategy. Sure. sure. Well, well, another question I have is one of the things I, I, I hear from you a lot is is the idea that and we kind of touched on it earlier was around uh, less harm of using vaping or vaping or using e-cigarettes compared to combustible cigarettes but do we know anything about does this vaping you know are kids who vape are they less likely to smoke combustible cigarettes are they more likely or does that put them at any less risk you know what I mean yeah. um, what, what do we know about that um, more likely yeah, to yeah. use other substances and to use uh, combustible cigarettes. Yeah. I think it's actually, I think in our state, when we looked at, I think, I think it's 24% more likely to use um, yeah. cigarette products. Um, but I, I think, you know, across the country, there's, there's different rates, but any, anyway, yeah, it definitely, what it does. And again, the uptake at a younger age, and I know you could yeah. speak to this a ton is that the, you know, you're rewiring the brain for addiction. Mm -hmm. If you start using it at a younger age, the brain is not fully developed. Sure. And you're using nicotine, which is rewiring your brain to make it more susceptible to addictions later on in your life. Sure. So the transitioning to other substances mm -hmm. or, or maybe you need to get a higher nicotine hit because your e-cigarette can no longer deliver that and you need to start smoking or using other things. And so, you know, there's, there, we have seen that, well, one thing that I will speak to when you, when you talk about data, um, e-cigarettes have been 
marketed um, as a as a way to quit using um, uh, tobacco products, um, even though the FDA says you can't market it that way because it's not a, a cessation tool. That's that's the message that's getting out there. Sure, sure. When we look at our rates in Utah of smoking rates and vaping rates for adults in particular, our smoking rate's not going down, and our vaping rate is going up. So what we're seeing is that there is not this, maybe on an individual level, once in a while, there's anecdotal information that would show that some people are able to step completely away from cigarettes by vaping. But here on a population scale, we're not seeing that the smoking rate is going down as the vaping rate is going up. They're both going up, which is unfortunate. So um, it has that effect on, on adults, but on youth, yeah, it can make them more susceptible to other products. One of the things when I was researching that, looking at our student health and risk prevention survey here in Utah, um, the thing that startles me is the 30 day and lifetime use rates among sixth graders. Usually like when you look at sixth graders, the monitoring the future survey doesn't collect stuff on sixth graders because it's usually like minuscule, like 0.2 sure, sure. Uh, for substances. And we're talking 5% <laughs> and it just breaks my heart, but that's, that speaks to who are they targeting? Sure. They're really reaching these young kids um, and the communities, again, it, it came onto the scene so fast and so unregulated that everyone kind of was like, oh, it's not a big deal or it's not a problem that yeah. these youth are like, oh, I, it's better than smoking. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and in my own, I'm a nerd in the sense that I like to look at stuff on my days off too. Um, but like I've watched a couple of shows where they've done not fully research-based st strategies so I, or um, studies, but when you look at those who were not smokers that started vaping and those who were smokers and started vaping, the outcome for the vape, the, the people who didn't vape before, it's not good. Like, it's not like as bad as if you were a, cig a combustible cigarette, but it's still not good for your lungs or the, the COPD, the asthma that develops from it. Um, so I just, the marketing, and I can remember, I can remember, this is how old I am, Stephen Dorff promoting blue. <laughs> and he was talking about how it was helping him stop smoking. And I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> my so, childhood crush. Well, well so, so one of the things I hear you saying is com combating the messaging yeah. in terms of what's out there. And, and as we know with, with youth and, and having access to things like cell phones, you know, probably cell phones more than anything, actually, even more yeah. so than computers or tablets, but getting bombarded with messages and, and those messages getting tailored towards them. So if they're looking up a vape product, then we know probably the next five advertisements they're going to get are going to be related to something maybe right. related to that product and so forth. That's actually one of the things, though, that I made a note of to bring up one of the ways that we could help, and it goes along with those prevention principles, yeah. is to make critical thinkers. And... We talk about the anecdotal information and the, or the research that we find, um, but having our youth and young adults and adults be critical thinkers to know why is this being marketed? What is it that it's sure. really going to do to my body? And instead of listening to a sound bite or instead of seeing one ad and saying, if it looks really nice and looks pretty simple or, or Braden does it, so of course it's cool, <laughs> looking and being a critical thinker and understanding how to deconstruct the media that it's being pushed at that sure. at them and i think there's a lot of programs out there that do that sure. but i think that would be a good stress for our kids okay. to figure out and that was one of my next questions i'm glad you, you led into that was what do we do like what are some of the things that we can do and you talked about being a critical thinker and i do think youth by and large make make good decisions i mean oh, yeah. we know right but there's some youth who, who struggle more with that than others but we also know that some critical thinking skills they have as, as i joked earlier about critical thinking around what's my next iPhone purchase going to be. They're probably pretty good. At, some of them are really pretty good at that. And they can yeah. tell you, you know, anytime I want to learn more about technology, I just asked my 17 year old daughter and, and she's more likely to know what most mo, more current and hip than I do, so to speak. But what are, your, what are some of your thoughts from your perspectives and, and how can we prevent them before they have to get to you in terms of the clinic and so forth? I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, out there. I, I'm, I am not nuanced at this, but I will say some tricks I've found with some of our younger patients is, um, you know, that, that feeling of rebellion is nice um, to take <laughs> advantage of and say, this is the man and the man is out to get you, like get you to use vape <laughs> products. Right. Yeah. Um, that sometimes uh, is effective. And then pointing out is, you know, a bubble, glove, bubble gum flavored vape, like really natural. Should you be putting that in your body? That seems to be a theme that tends to work well when I'm coaching young people. 
Yeah. Um, but you guys can provide much more <laughs> um, evidence-based guidance than I can. Uh, well, that is all true. Yeah, that is great. Um, I mentioned the focus group testing that we've done in the past. And one of the things, and you're right, youth are smart. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, and, and really what they were saying is show us data, show us reasons why this, why we shouldn't be using this. They really wanted to know that information. But what, is so, it, what is it doing to us, right? What is it doing to our range yeah, of bodies? Was, yeah. And some of that we don't, we don't quite know yet. Yeah, what effect yeah. is it having on us, right? Yeah. And so when there was messaging that looked kind of hokey or tried to be silly and approach it from a, from a standpoint of, you know, it's an important thing, but we're trying to get you this way because your kids, sure, like sure. that didn't play well at all. Yeah. And it's like, you know, take us seriously. We... We just want to know the truth, um, yeah. and we want to know what the data says. Um, something that Susanna mentioned earlier that I wanted to mention as well. So one of the approaches that we have taken that I failed to mention earlier with our media messaging is has been uh, the parents' involvement sure. in the life of their of their kids. And so we had a, a brief campaign which we want to keep on going. It's just uh, you know the funding for e-cigarette stuff is a little bit different than what we can use for tobacco, but. Um, it was called the Tobacco Talk, and it was about having a talk with your kids about there's new kinds of products. Sure. They're not, you know, it's not just the same cigarettes. You've got these different things that look different. Um, and then recently, we've just started one this year, which is called, um, which is about flavors and how, and how flavors impact kids and how they can hook kids. Um, and so that's just another approach as well. So that's going from the parents you know, trying to but, but get those parents involved. I think involved. that's important because you, when you probably, when you work with parents, I guess, is, at least I know I get this, is how do I talk to this about yeah. Yeah. with my kids? Other than just saying, yeah. don't do it. Or, or just, or maybe even not even wanting to bring it up because they think that's going to put it in their head, right? right? And and, yeah. and we know that's probably not the best approach, but you have to talk to it somehow. You know, do we have a family meeting and all of a sudden this is the agenda topic? Do we talk about it over dinner? How do we even broach that topic, you know? So I think that's, that's yeah. helpful. That, well, my guess is that's probably helpful to parents. It is, and we we actually <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to go talk. It was a good video. Um, yeah. But one of the things I would say is that the best kind of prevention in a family like that sure. is said you aren't going to say, "Okay, kids, today I have this PowerPoint, <laughs> and we are going to tell you all about neg yeah. negative consequences." Um, <laughs> but it is about that bonding. So going back to that social yeah. development strategy. So if you're spending time. Um, doing things with your kids, whether you're a single parent, whether you're a grandparent. Um, there's plenty of research, by the way, with grandparents being involved, that it's a positive influence. So spending time with our families and extended families with clear guidelines. It is not sure. like, hey, we're going to go to the bar and I'm going to go drink and you can go play in the arcade. But, hey, we're going to go out for a hike or we're going to go, we're going to go to a comic convention or we're going to go <laughs> to um, this and it doesn't have to cost money. Sure. It doesn't have to do anything. And that's more impactful. Sitting down to a meal and having a conversation saying, okay, Jason and Braden, tell me about your days. Yeah. Um, I want to know, what did you do? What were some concerns you had? And sure. having that dialogue is probably one of the best ways to start. Um, but I, I will tell you, going back to the question of what can we do? Oh, if we have in our communities kind of a, an action plan mm -hmm. that has had policy and ordinances and has the best practices that we have um, and involves people even from like libraries of like, hey, how can we promote these activities at the library that are positive sure. and great? Sure. That's a positive thing that will help our communities be healthier and ultimately our youth and young adults. Um, campuses. You know, we're seeing a big thing on campuses. I know a number of them in the state of Utah went to tobacco free, but they had to clarify that also includes e-cigarettes. Sure, sure. Um, but it's again hard to detect. So how does a how does a, a campus address it? Well, same thing. They have positive environments. They have um, activities that don't involve tobacco or um, alcohol or other things, and they really encourage getting outdoors. In, in the Mountain Plain states, we have so many opportunities as families and as community members to get out and do something that is positive, whether it's hiking or hunting, if you're into that, or uh, camping, sure. just exploring and doing new things. Those are the things that I think will be, no, there's research actually, that tie that to having a healthier outcome for kids. But we can't do it, I can't do it without ordinances. I watched communities, um, so in 2011 or 2013, we started surveying about vaping, mm -hmm. and we saw two communities were really, really high, <laughs> like mm -hmm. higher than the rest of the state, um, one of which I live in. 
And so those two communities took the approach of starting ordinances. They changed their, their um, consumption numbers drastically by the next one. Yes. And because they became proactive and they made it a part of their plan for those communities, they were able to address it and slow it down. That doesn't mean that they're not more kids using, but it's just like they're slowing the yeah, flow. They reverse, they reverse the trend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. may not completely go away, right. but what you're saying, it's probably a multi-pronged approach that Absolutely. everyone needs to be involved in. Yes. It's yeah. not just one person or another. And, yeah. and kind of to that point, I think one of the side effects with this whole Valley, Valley situation, um, which I think was one good effect, was that um, maybe similar to the what happened with opioids, so many stakeholders and partners like identify the problem and have come come to be involved. Uh, and so like we've been working more closely together. We have schools that have been is so interested in doing stuff related to this. Uh, the legislature is like, we need to do something. Um, never before have they been so interested in working with tobacco control, um, you know, at this time. And it's just, just people from community, from city government, from, like I mentioned, the schools, the universities, um, mental health facilities, just the conversation around this, everybody is interested in doing something around it and wants to be involved uh, to impact it. So. so so, one thought is maybe, I guess, a, a fortunate outcome of, of some of the cases, UCV Valley cases, is it, is it produces action in folks. An unfortunate outcome, I guess we had to wait this long to get there because we know there's a lot of folks who probably are not using but are at risk of using and we, do, we want to prevent them from getting to that point where they're, they're going to be in your clinic, per right. se. So there's kind of areas along the continuum that we need to work on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Great. This, is, this has been a really, a really good conversation. Um, I wanted to see if we could spend a little bit of time <clears throat> to see if we had any questions um, out from folks who are viewing and see what those are. Uh, yeah, go ahead and um, for, for folks on the line. This is a great opportunity for you to ask questions. Go ahead and type in the chat feature. Is there anything you've heard or anything you want someone to follow up on or anything maybe we haven't addressed yet? Um, I actually have a question for Dr. Callahan. Okay. Um, one of the things that, um, that we've been curious about and, and we've heard a few people in the region mention is um, <laughs> are you working on any future studies on the effects of e-cigarettes and vaping? Um, we are attempting to, to see um, what lung function does over time in people who are healthy who didn't get e-valley. Um, that is in the works. Um, this is um, been obviously in uh, an area of needed pursuit, ac academic pursuit. Um, so that's coming. We're, we're looking into that. And I know that a lot of other institutions around the country are looking at, it, at that as well. Um, this has been a real wake-up call for all of us that we need to, you know, we, we know that COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease happens in people who smoke combustible cigarettes over time. But, you know, cigarettes have been around hundreds of years. This has only been around since 2007 in the United States. So we, we just don't know the long-term effects. Um, so to be seen. Well, and I would say one of the things that we found out is that the ABCD study the adolescent brain cognitive development study, they're gonna they're including that, the vaping on that one. So yeah. Great. Um, okay, so we have a couple of different people Susanna. asking for you to, um, and this I believe we go to Susanna and, and possibly Braden. <laughs> what types of ordinance ordinances um, were passed in the cities that you mentioned earlier? Could you talk a little bit more about um, the types of ordinances that your your city used to um, get the numbers to go down? Yeah, so one of the things that they changed, and this was in the southern Utah area and in northern Utah area, so like not Salt Lake Valley, so. Um, it's a more rural area. Yeah. Right? A little bit, yeah. I'd love to think that I live in a rural area, but yeah, sure. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, it's not, it's not the metropolitan or uh, yeah. the well, main city here. Well, I think it's important to point out because uh, the states that we work with, a lot oh, yeah. of course, are rural. Yeah, so. oh, that's true. I forgot yeah. about that. Sorry, guys. Um, but one of the things is they, first, I want to point out, they worked with their coalition and they worked with the youth, and the youth helped come up with the ideas for these specific ordinances. Mm -hmm. Some of it was changing where <laughs> you could purchase it. Um, so it moved it from um, some of the uh, general, general retailers. Re retailers to the um, smoke shops specifically. Um, and one of it was 
I'm trying to remember if they changed um, something. What did it was Iron County, and they it was their Cedar City camp group that um, really looked at changing how the youth could access it. And I want to say, and that's why the preemptive preemptive. Am I saying that right? Preemption, yeah. Preemption is so crucial because that, uh, a year ago that would have changed the law that they put in. I believe they changed some of the access as far as the age down in Iron mm. County, but I want to check on that one. Utah County did do that. Yeah. yeah. So those are the kinds of things that start out um, that they know again with best practices of what worked for tobacco. Um, they've worked on um, vaping in parks. Um, so in the public setting, they have worked on um, uh, how they, uh, again, the access, because I know there's a lot of places where they were getting easy access through the convenience stores or, um, and again, as you said, the general retailers. So, and I'd have to, I apologize. I didn't know, like, I, I know I can go and find the specific ordinances and send them out sure. to you guys. But it sounds like one of the things you mentioned too is they engage some of the stakeholders or yeah. direct consumers yeah. of this issue and, and that helps inform what they yeah. do. Yeah. And that's a national level. I thought it was really great. Our youth, it was the youth that went and spoke to a representative mm -hmm. that held, that was part of the group that just recently passed the um, the change to the 21 tobacco stuff, but also anything that they're looking at, they're, they're hungry for good policy. Sure. Um, and so they want to change it. Um, and so the person, I will find out the ordinances. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Susanna's contact information will be posted at the end. And so um, for those couple of people who are interested in the specific ordinances, mm -hmm. why don't you reach out to Susanna through uh, via email and um, she can get that information to you. A couple of other questions. Um, someone is wanting to know, is this a multicultural issue? Ooh, mm -hmm. I, I sadly don't have data. I didn't look at all the data. I just looked at the general yeah, that's that is a great question because when you look at tobacco, yes, mm -hmm. it definitely is that that is uh, more easily. Def you can see that its use rates, especially here, where our use rates are so low, you have populations that are higher than the or equal to the national average. Uh, with vaping, it's more across the board level, um, mm -hmm. uh, more so than just uh, you know than what we see with. Cigarettes. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but that's another thing you can follow up with me yeah. if you're interested and we could figure out exactly what population is. Is there any possibly related to the communities that get marketed towards and, and where some of these? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now it seems like e cigarettes are, are kind of ubiquitous. They're all over the place, right? Yes. But, but my guess is that um, businesses, you know, Marketeers have strategies and plans mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I, didn't, I wouldn't think that. Yeah, and the history so. of like the density of a shop, like, sure. Like that's why it's important also to have like zoning regulations yeah. and things, so you so you don't have a, a community that is inundated with 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 shops that sell these products because typically they do go into lower income mm -hmm. areas that are more that that are maybe don't have as much diversity just because they can they can infiltrate those areas and those use rates in those areas are typically higher than mm -hmm. other places. So, mm -hmm. does yeah. anyone have any um, information? Someone's wanting to know, like the tobacco settlement. Will there be funding to comment e-cigarette usage? Does anybody have any knowledge? We can that? only hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I would say to that is right now, currently it's a state by state basis. And what they're doing is, um, there's two things. One is trying to, trying to put a tax in on e-cigarettes mm -hmm. because then that will get income and hopefully it would be allocated back to the prevention programs. Like the one that's going through our legislature right now, fortunately does direct the money back to trying to prevent the problem. Good. So that's good. So a tax, and there are some states that have uh, taken legal action against Juul. So there's a possibility of getting a settlement through that. Right, right. Yeah. right. So I think those are, those are <clears throat> two ways that that could come about. Um, this, like there's not a federal tax yet on yeah. e-cigarettes. Um, you know, I don't know what the likelihood of that happening anytime soon would be. Um, but so I think those are the two approaches that could possibly and, get some money. Just to follow up on that, you've seen, I've seen a lot of stuff in the news around not just states, but school districts perhaps Ooh, as well, okay. taking uh, action against uh, Juul, other manufacturers as well. So other entities within, within a particular state. Yeah. who may do it as well. So, I mean, yeah. more to come on that. We'll see what the outcomes are mm -hmm. in terms of what happens, but yeah. Um, another question is, what is the best study on Evali um, that I can reference? Um, and then the second part of that question, are most of the effects of Evali from the heated 
um, flavoring that can be primarily used for oral ingestion, but never improved for inhal inhalation, if that makes so, sense. So, um, Evali, this illness that we saw, Evali, was probably related to the vitamin E acetate um, that was used as an agent to cut the THC oil. Um, so not every case was in, was uh, vitamin E implicated in it, but the majority were. Um, and the idea behind it is um, THC is the most expensive product in these, uh, these, these THC oils. So if you can stretch your product, you can make more money so that they are adding vitamin E to it. Um, so it's, a, it's an oily substance and it's that plus the heating element of the e-cigarette is probably what caused this. Um, eliminating e valley we don't, or sorry, eliminating vitamin E acetate, we don't know if that will um, completely negate any other future cases of e valley because there's so many different flavors, there's so many different um, formulas, there's so many different heating temperatures. There's a logarithmic uh, potential of um, toxins that could happen from this, and we don't know, could this happen with some other combination? Um, Sounds like there's a lot of variables involved. There's a ton of variables. Yeah. Um, that's why understanding the underlying biology of what's happening sure. probably makes more sense than all these compounds because there's just so many. And of they're that. changing, right? C correct, exactly. Yeah. Um, the best study, I think it really depends on what the, the, the questioner wants to know. Um, probably the most detailed um, research paper that's been done looking at a large group of patients um, with E Valley and um, how they presented was done here at Intermountain um, uh, Health Center. Um, and that was published in Lancet in October of this past year, October, November of this past year. Um, that's probably the best like representation of what E-Valley looks like. Then we can come back and get some of those yeah. references and then post them later as well. Sure, sure, sure absolutely. So. And then it, it, kind of a follow-up question to that. <clears throat> Someone is asking, would you say that vaping marijuana is more harmful than vaping nicotine? Um, that's really, um, that's hard to say. So we think that probably what caused like e is and what irritates people's airways if they have asthma is probably more the, um, the vehicle that nicotine or THC are, are in. So it's probably more the stuff that it's in more so than the ingredients. And so then it come, becomes a value statement. Do you think nicotine or THC is worse? And you know, probably shouldn't be using either. I mean, you should not be using either period. And I would, that's what I would say. I'm like, I don't really think it's sure. about what it is because some of the things that we're seeing is that kids are using what they believe are just juices or just exactly. flavorings of and any of that is going to be harmful. Like when you're doing, again, this is stuff that's been tested maybe again to swallow, but not to inhale. Sure. And I don't, I mean, that's, well, that's me. Let me, and some of the studies would suggest that when you ask youth what they're using, they don't yeah. even know. It yeah, they don't, not sure. What they actually are using. Right. But let me go back to a point you were making. So mm -hmm. let me get this straight. So with the vitamin E acetate, you were saying that was being used to cut the THC. Correct. To get to more amounts. Correct. Mm -hmm. It was so the, the distributors can make more money. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I want to make sure I understood that correctly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so one, one last question for you, um, Dr. Callahan, and then we'll, we'll move along, is someone is wanting to know, what are the basics that we can tell kids and young adults about the medical dangers of vaping? Um, so beyond this illness that happened in the past year, um, which something like this could very easily happen again, right? So there's always going to be an incentive to cut one of these supply chains with something that will stretch their THC because THC is a, a banned substance or it's a legal substance. So if people want to use THC, they're going to uh, go after um, less reputable sources. And there's always going to be an incentive to cut the product so the distributor can make much more money. So that, that risk is always going to be there that something like this could happen again. So you don't always know what you're getting. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I have several patients who swore up and down they were going to vape shops to get their products and they got this illness and when they had um, studies looking to see if they had vitamin E, they did. Um, so they're not always completely sure what they have. And were those patients also saying they weren't vaping THC? Like, were they? Um, some. Some? <laughs> some. Just wondering, because vape yeah. shops, right, should yeah. be selling a THC product. Correct. Well, some of them would go out of state, okay. right? So um, the... 
the long-term effects we worry especially about people with pre-existing lung disease so if they have asthma if they have COPD but you know for our age demographic it's usually asthma so young people um, the major risk is that it's going to precipitate their asthma and make it harder to control. So they may have more ER visits. They may have to see their primary care doc, go to the urgent care a bunch, be admitted to the hospital with asthma exacerbations. That's probably the most tangible real world risk for these people. So can I ask you a question? Yep. And you may not know the answer because research. Um, are there incidences where maybe, not maybe, but the um, vaping may have created or started what looks like asthma, but the, the, the youth or the person didn't have a history of asthma, or do so they just make an That's system? a really fascinating question, okay. and um, it's a really prescient one. We don't know, okay. but um, my suspicion is some of these people, it's probably precipitated asthma. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've seen a few people in, um, in clinic after this illness that went around, and some of them have bad asthma at this point. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, it's a chicken or the egg. I don't sure, know if the sure. asthma made them more prone to this or if they've Do, developed you it. Think, are they still vaping? I mean, well, was, that's always a great question. Right, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you work with, with enough young people, sure, sure. you know that they're going to lie about it. I know, I know exactly, yeah. So, um, you know, they, they swear that they've stopped, but, but that's suspicious. Sure, right? right. okay. You know, so we're we're coming up on time. Um, I wanted to know if there's if there is one last question maybe we can address. Or um, yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and, and take this one this one last question. Is anyone doing a root cause analysis of whether smoking is a symptom of other things? Basically, are youth vaping or smoking to connect with others? Well, I would. I don't know if there's a study i'm sure there is and i know that's part of what that adolescent brain cognitive development thing we'll be looking at um and you can look that by the way abcdstudy.org um but we know that with any substances with tobacco with alcohol with opioids there um tends to be something that they're looking for whether it was started out as an experimentation or they had actual pain from the opioids, it tends to fill something where they don't have that connection. And when we have, we're talking about youth again, who are using technology um, much better than I do and spend a lot more time with screens, whether it's a phone, a computer, sure, sure. A tablet, whatever, um, that provides them some sort of a, a fill in that connection with that pathway that we want. Sure. Um, but I would say that that's where, again, those communities come into play. Let's look at ways that we can build those connections. Um, that social development strategy is absolutely important to say to parents and to teachers and to, you know, clergy, neighbors, whatever. Like, instead of sitting in my room, like, that was a great question for me. How many, how many people on your block do you know? Yeah. How many people in your neighborhood do you talk to on a regular basis yeah. um, that you don't, your kids don't go to school with? That was the other thing for me as a parent where I was at um, having those relationships. So, so one of the things I think to end on here is, is um, connections. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, there needs to be multiple connections involved, multiple experts, multiple communities multiple people involved in that in order to address this issue. So, we, we could probably go on for another hour, but we don't have the time. Um, I really want to thank each of you three for coming today and spending your time with us um, and really giving some diverse perspectives about how we approach this. And I think that kind of mirrors the overall one of the things we're talking about. We have to come from at it from different angles yeah. and to use our best knowledge.